Hey, uh, so the next chapter was all about basically delivering and timing and how do we pace it out to get like the best thinking out of our students. And this, I'll be honest with you, was the chapter that kind of like threw me for a loop. And it was primarily because you have three to five minutes after starting your lesson. So that doesn't include time of like, hey, how are you? And those little side conversation stuff. It's So it's the, the minute you start kind of commanding the attention of your class and getting them on task, you have three to five minutes before you have to start your thinking task. Otherwise, um, there'll be a lot of more like resistance to thinking. And so you have three to five minutes basically to tee up the activity. Um, the chapter walks through some strategies. So for example, having the students come up and kind of form like a huddle, if you will, like so a standing huddle, similar to like a coach walking through plays. So if you have that huddle and the students standing around you, um, their attention is way better. They look at their phones a lot less. And so in that three to five minutes, you're going to kind of tee them up and kind of, for example, I can see in science doing things, for example, a demo. So for ex when I do Newton's second law, um, I'll typically have a cart with some mass and have the mass hanging off and I'll run it and I'll ask students kind of, what do you think? What do you see? And then uh, dive into Newton's second law lab. So I can see this as becoming like a thinking task where we do the demo of the activity, uh, whether it's Newton's second law, uh, momentum, energy, like there's so many examples where you use demos in science to kind of tease out an idea. So we can do the demo, talk about it, and then let the students go. And so I was just trying to rack my brain because initially when I saw it, I thought that that meant I basically had five minutes a day and then the other 70 minutes would be them doing deeper dives. But the actuality is you only have to do that for the first kind of two weeks until you get that thinking classroom mentality going, you get the habits formed, you have the students working hard and using their brains when they walk in your classroom, and then you can start kind of backing off. And they'll talk about that apparently more in chapter nine. So this is more just for the first two weeks of class. You've got basically your like side conversations, you start, you've got three to five minutes to kind of tee off the activity and then have them go. I think that in an online classroom or in a, not an online, but like a hybrid system that we're looking at where you've got like two and a half hours, I can see breaking that into like two or three distinct chunks. So for example, having the students do um, a like activity and then coming out and us talking about it and then going into another activity and coming out and talking about it. But having those good solid thinking chunks in those first couple of days is going to really help kind of set the tone and help make things more successful. So I was really panicking at the beginning because I was trying to figure out how do I take all these beautiful scaffolded inquiry lessons that I've got um, and how do I turn them into like a little teaser and then having the students do a deep dive exploration. But it doesn't have to be that way. You can actually do this um, and you can bring those inquiry questions into play. You can do those types of activities. It's just at the very beginning in that starting week, ideally, you want to do kind of big thinking questions, ones that maybe don't have a lot of um, perfect answers. I'm thinking like Fermi problems would be a really good example. If you're not familiar with Fermi problems, Fermi problems are questions that have like impossible answers to get, like how many blades of grass are on a football field? How many apples would an average Canadian eat a year? How many gallons of water do restaurants use to clean produce to run in a uh, a month like it, it, questions that don't have really good like concrete answers where students have to estimate and make assumptions to be able to get to an answer um so i can see those as being really good ones there's an activity i do with perimeter institute um and it's all about um it's under the guise of expansion of the universe, but really the students have to come up with their own unit of measurement um, and basically have washers and elastics. And so that those types of activities you do, the, the collaborative team building, they can all be done. Um, they're just going to need some modification and some tweaks to get it so that you're doing kind of like a little like demo or tee up or other kind of situation where you kind of get them going and then you just kind of let them fly. And so that is a very, very different model to what I'm used to. Um, and I think that is a very different model from what a lot of teachers are used to. So this is the first chapter that I've run into that has really made me think about my practice, really made me think about how I organize things and also made me realize how much I'm spoon feeding the kids even with all of the changes I've still made. So I'm excited to try some new things. As I develop resources, I'll definitely um, include them in the description below.